good? Ready? MC? Okay. Hi, and welcome to our 9 o'clock press conference, Photos from the Future Depict Vegetation and Snow Cover Changes. Our speaker is Mark Stiglitz, Associate Professor in the School of Civil and Engineering, Civil Engineering at Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta, Georgia. Mark? Okay. So what I'll talk about is, is photorealistic rendering of future land cover. And the question we asked in this work was, what would land cover look like in 50 to 100 years from now? And there are a number of ways you can approach this problem. Um, you can use a detailed, physically-based model. And when you do your computation with, with this model, you have, so it's a physically-based model. You have a set of differential equations. You code them up, um, and you, you run your simulations on the computer. And when you run these models, because they're, they're physically based, you're running at a very, very small grid resolution. Maybe it's a meter, maybe it's a half a meter, whatever you want that to be. And while that's great for getting the processes, it's very problematic when you want to run over large areas. When you run just for processes, maybe I run it over some very small area, um, tens of square meters, hundreds of square meters, but when you want to do thousands of kilometers, computationally, it's, it's infeasible. So you look for another solution. And the other solution, or another solution, is that you can do your modeling like you do in climate models. You could say, I've got this very, very big grid. Maybe that grid is a kilometer, maybe it's 10 kilometers, and maybe it's 100 square kilometer grids. And that relieves your computational burden. But when you do it at such large grid sizes, you lose all of the nonlinear dynamics that you as an ecologist, let's say, we're trying to capture. So neither of these two options are, are particularly attractive. So we took a different way of approaching this problem. Um, and what our approach allows us to do is simultaneously predict over large areas, to do it in a computationally fast manner, and one that makes full use of what fine-scale information you have. And I'll talk about what that fine-scale information is in a few minutes. The other thing that the approach does is it lets you do things like this. It lets you generate photorealistic renderings of what the landscape might look like in the future. And for us, in the future is um, 2070. You'll see that. So, so let's begin. and. Um, You'll see, I'll, I'll start with my results, and then I'll move to my methods um, of how we did this. And as far as the results are concerned, I'm going to show you three sites. One in northwest Washington, where there's perennial snow cover. One um, um, along the Sierras, along the spine of the Sierras, where you get a large amount of snow. And then one in north central New Mexico, just north of Santa Fe. Each of these sites are between 10,000 and 15,000 square kilometers. So they're fairly big sites, and that's, that's the objective. The objective is to be able to work at these large scales, but still use the fine scale information. OK, so let's start with the Washington site. Um, so what you see in the top panel is essentially a a visual image taken from the Landsat satellite, and um, this is shown for the, this one is for the year 2000, and the, and the, the, the spatial resolution of this, uh, this here is, um, the Landsat has a spatial resolution of 30 meters. So, so relatively speaking, it's a very, very fine scale um, image here. I think what we presented is at 150 meters, but I'd have to check that. Now, the, the, the real feature and the real reason I chose the Northwest um, Washington is that there's this ring. If you look at that yellow arrow, there's a ring of perennial snow cover um, that starts at the top and then comes in sort of a, an arc down through the image. 
Would you rather me use the, uh, this here? Okay. So, so what you see in the, in the bottom image is our predicted land cover for the year 2070. And again, if you look at, let's see, this area right here, you see, and compare it to the top, what you see is a real drop, um, a decrease in the perennial snow cover. And you see it all along this arc that comes here. You want me to use that? Yeah. Okay. So, so what you see is this large decrease in perennial snow cover in the year 2070. And this is our photorealistic rendering. And again, I'll tell you how we do that in just a little while. So, and I also will talk about, so one of the things is, is how much is there snow melt? And in this case, and I won't say snow, I'll say snow cover. What this is, is snow cover. And overall, for this site, there's about a 65% reduction in snow cover. Now, Perennial snow at this site only takes up 1% of the area, but just to give you some idea of what the decreases are, it's 65% of that perennial snow cover is gone in the prediction. So let's go on to the next site, and that's the New Mexico site. So this is another site, and I think this one is, is 10,000 square kilometers. In the top image, again, you see the Landsat image, um, this is just north of Santa Fe. There are really three types of vegetation that exist here. There are shrubs that really dominate these lowlands. There's the grasses right over here in the lowland. And then the rest of it is mostly evergreen forest. And um, what I'm really trying to show is the major feature here is if you look where the yellow arrow is, these are the, the high elevation areas here are the lowlands, and in the high elevation areas where there's warming going on in the climate change scenario, what you see is an infilling, a loss of the grasses, and an infilling of the evergreen trees. Okay, so let's go to ask the next question. So one of the things that we wanted to know was we wanted to see how seasonal snow cover might be impacted by climate change. So we examined um, April snow cover extent in the Sierras of California. So this is a site that's about 13,000 square kilometers. Um, what we looked at in this case is not an annual picture, but we wanted to see what the snow cover, how it would change for the month of April. So our base map is again 2000, but in this case the Landsat um, image is for April 2000. Again, always the, the same high resolution in, um, of about 150 meter resolution, grid resolution. And here in the predicted, in the 2070 April scenario, what you see is a large fall off, a large decrease in the snow cover. And this decrease is somewhere on the order of 35%. So, so what I've just shown you are um, really our three renderings of how these three sites in the Western United States might be changed in a photorealistic way um, by the year 2070. So let me talk just a little while about how we do this. So we use a machine learning technique um, known as regression trees. And rather than um, sort of try and walk you through what the exact features of machine learning or regression trees, I'll just tell you how this calculation is done because it's done relatively simple. So what you have is, here's our image, and this is the image of New Mexico. This is a Landsat image. This is a color image. And with each of those 150 meter pixels is associated with a color. So keep that in the back of your mind. But we also have some other data, some high resolution data. We have, so from the USGS and the space shuttle, we have 30 meter elevation data in the United States. So for each little pixel that we have here, we have a color. And I'll go to here to show it. We have, at this pixel, we have a color. 
We also have this other information. We have elevation data. We have aspect data, meaning I have, I'm on a slope. I know whether it's high or low. Aspect, I know what angle the land is pointing at. And then there's the slope. I also have what's the tilt of the landscape at that point. And we also have a database for the present precipitation and the present temperature, annual, for each of these points. So, so what we have are really two data sets. We have one data set, data set and the precip and the temperature, we only have that at a downscaled to 1,000 meters. But nevertheless, we have two data sets of relatively high resolution. One, which is elevation, aspect, slope, precipitation, and temperature. And we can relate every one of those predictors to a target, which is the base color. And that's how this works. And that's, we do a learning algorithm. And it learns by associations. So we take these, what turn out to be about over half a million pixels of predictor variables to the target variable to the target variable, and we, in, in the process of doing this, we develop an association model that does that, that relates those two. So you take this association model and you put it, once you've trained it on the present data, you put this association model aside, and what you say is, let's do a climate change, a climate change for 2070. So what you do is you have some, what you do is you Keep your elevation, every point still has the same elevation, has the same aspect, has the same slope, but what's different is the precipitation and temperature. So we take the downscaled climate out, GCM output for precipitation and temperature during this period, and we swap them with the present. And we take then our association model and use that with these new predictor variables to get a future color. And that's what you're looking at when you're looking at our rendering of a site in 2070. And again, this is the New Mexico site. OK, so let's continue. So since I'm the only person here, I'm going to go a few minutes longer. And I'm going to talk about something, sort of the complement to this process. And it's called classification trees. And what's nice about it is it allows you to take some of those photo, when you look at the photorealistic pictures, it's not always easy to say exactly quantitatively how much has changed from image A to B. This method allows you to do it. And it's complementary because it does it in the exact same way with one little change, the methodology. So what you're looking at here is not a Landsat image, but you're looking at the 30 meter USGS land cover classification map. And USGS created this in the year 2000, this particular map. It is at 30 meter resolution, and it tells you in a color scheme what vegetation you're looking at. And there are 16 vegetations in all. And what you have, again, for this New Mexico site is in the uplands, you have the evergreen. Um, you have the evergreen vegetation here and here. And in the lowlands, you have the light yellow being the grasses and the brown being the shrubs. And so what we do here, instead of doing our learning algorithm where we take elevation aspect slope present temperature, present precip as our predictive variables and creating an association model to a color, now we do it to a land classification. So here what we do is the same process. We develop our association model, put it aside, then swap the future temperature and the future precip into the predictive variables and predict what the future land cover classes will be. And so if you look at that New Mexico picture, it's, it's really quite similar to what you saw before. Over here you see the, the loss of the grasses and the infilling of the evergreen vegetation. But you also see something that was harder to see in the visual picture, which was there was, 
in the climate change scenario, most of the warming was in the lowlands here. And so what you see here between the upper panel, and, and I say this is Landsat, and that is, that's the classification image, not the Landsat. Um, what you see in the top image is you see the grasses are being lost and the shrubs are expanding. And um, we, we have the quantified numbers for this, and I have that on a poster for later on to tell you exactly how much one went up and one went down. So here you see three things going on. In the uplands, you see that warming along the slopes allows the evergreens to infill. And then the higher warming in the valleys reduces the grass, and it's taken over by the shrubs. And if we go to our Washington site, here you can see essentially the same thing. I'm showing you now the classification map for Washington. The white is again that sort of ring of perennial snow cover. And when we do the classification map, what you see is the loss in the snow cover. And as the snow cover gets lost, lost the evergreens start to fill into those areas. OK. So there are really just two caveats that I want to make sure are clear. One is what we're looking at and what we're predicting is snow cover, not snow depth. So when you say a pixel or an area has cover, it, I'm saying it, it's covered by snow. I'm not saying it's two inches, and I'm not saying it's two meters. And that's a real caveat that you need to keep in mind, because as we go forward, that's something we're going to try and bring into the picture. But right now, what you're looking at is a statistical association learning model that predicts snow cover. The second thing is that, oh, some reason it's cutting off. Um, the, prediction, the predicted vegetation is the equilibrium vegetation. So what I mean by that is what I'm saying is in the predicted 2070 maps that you're looking at, that is the vegetation that would be there if we considered it in equilibrium in the climate. That is, if you assume that currently it's in equilibrium with the climate. Okay? Because remember, you're just doing a statistical model on what's there today as your base map to what's happening in the future. Climate change the, the rate of change of climate may be, in fact, greater than the ability of the vegetation to respond to that particular rate of change. So in summary, what, what we've done is developed a relatively fast method, something we can do on my laptop in minutes, to predict land cover change over large areas that, that use the fine scale information that's available to us today. We do it, um, the method yields photorealistic renderings. And for us, what that means, you know, it's, it's a very visually intuitive way of looking at the land surface. You look at it and you can say, oh, I see what's going on there. You don't really need a full explanation. And then um, there's a talk at 12 noon, and there's a poster at 4.30, which will cover this again. Um, the, the poster session will go into more detail. And then I just wanted to say something about the authors. This is a collaboration between my group in, in civil and environmental engineering and Greg Turk's group in the School of Interacting Computing. And the two names up above, Philippe Diaz and Yuting Gu, they're the ones who did all the work on this. And, and they're, the, they're our students for this project. So that is, um, that concludes the talk. Thank you. And, um, and now we'll take any questions from the audience. Any questions from the chat? I have a question. Can you hear me OK on this? I have a question from Larry O'Hanlon from Discovery News. And the question is, don't grasslands already shift into forest lands without climate change? I'm sorry, could you say that once more? Don't grasslands already shift into forest lands without climate change? Um, I'm trying to understand exactly 
the, the question. There, there are, so don't grasslands already change, shift? Or you, are you asking, have they already shifted? Ah, okay. So this is a question from someone who's watching on the internet, so give, give us just one moment to get okay. clarification. <laughs> so he's, say, he's clarifying by saying se secession, succession of grasslands, of, sorry, of grasses to forests. Well, you always have, have, succession is always playing out on the landscape. And, um, but what we're doing is we're just doing a statistical model for the current vegetation and, and what that rendering will be like in 2070. You're not doing anything physically based in a sense like succession. You're not taking that into account in a model like this. But yes, succession goes on all the time. And if the question was, if you left this landscape alone, would it would it move from the grasses to the forest? The question is maybe. It depends on those, the images that I've shown are at relatively high altitudes. So maybe it wouldn't move to the evergreen or maybe it would be very slow because of the cold temperatures along those slopes and, and where those slopes are. So there's the elevation, the cold temperatures. But keep in mind, this is a statistical model that is developing associations. It is not a mechanistic model where you can ascribe causalities. And I hope that answers in some sense. Any other questions? Any other questions from the room? OK, that concludes our press conference. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next press conference will be at 10.30 AM on climate change and winemaking in Quebec. Are we done?